Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to Polycarp's Paradigm. My name is Eric Robinson, and I'm very thankful that you've come to check out this podcast Last episode, I introduced the Eucharist and kind of the framework and how this is a really high stakes conversation. And just to give you a little insight on the last episode, I kid you not, towards the end of that episode, I could really feel the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to explain it other than a lightness came over me and immediately when I stopped recording, I just fell to my knees and just praised God. And it was just like an amazing experience just reflecting with you all on the fact that God is love and that God just loves us so much. He gives his very own son to us and he gives us his very own son each and every time we go to mass in the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is Jesus Christ under the appearance of bread and wine. Like this is a fascinating an amazing, a, a crazy mystery of our faith. Um, and it's just that, right? It's a mystery. And God himself, the Trinity, is a knowable mystery. We can know him, but there's endless depth to him. We can know God. We can know that he exists. We can know that he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. But knowing that leads us to encounter him And encountering him leads us into further mystery of of knowing him. So, oh my goodness. So we are treading on mysterious realities here. But to help explain the mystery, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was so kind in the 1200s to coin the term transubstantiation, which means a change in the substance. He was actually using Aristotelian, that is, logic from Aristotle, the language of Aristotle, to describe this mystery. Now, the early church held to this mystery from day one. Um, Obviously, I read you in John's Gospel in chapter 6, what Jesus himself said, and John's disciple, Ignatius of Antioch, echoes that teaching. St. Justin Martyr also echoes that teaching. St. Polycarp, St. Irenaeus, St. Cyprian, all these saints... (laughs) echo that teaching. Last week, I I shared with you how the stakes are high. Like, if the Catholic Church is wrong, they are committing idolatry because they're worshiping bread. Uh, But if they're right, then they're actually worshiping Jesus. If they're worshiping Jesus, like, if that's actually Jesus under the appearance of bread and wine, then my goodness, it's time for everyone to come into full communion with the Catholic Church if you want to follow Jesus, right? Like, it's because that's Jesus. <laughs> if you want to follow him, you got to go where he is. Oh man, so the stakes are very high in this game. I myself have confidence that the Catholic Church's teaching is the teaching of Jesus, that it's correct, uh, because I trust in the authority of Jesus, that he really is the Son of God, and I trust that the teaching has been preserved and faithfully transmitted from the time of Jesus to the apostles and their successors and beyond. So when you look at the writings of the early earliest Christian writings that we have, they speak of this mystery. They speak of it very profoundly. So the thing is, is like, don't listen to my opinion of the matter, but maybe you should listen to theirs, the early Christians, because they are way closer to this teaching and the original source than we are, right? So if I'm wrong, then they're wrong. If they're wrong, we're in big trouble because then we don't actually even know what the Christian faith is or could be. Um, Scripture's clear, but it's only clear through the certain lens of the early Christian fathers, right? Because everyone can come to their own conclusions or own interpretations if all you go by is Scripture. 
In fact, Satan knows scripture better than any of us do. He quoted scripture to Jesus when he tempted him in the desert. Even Peter says that many people twist Paul's words to their own destruction. So what we need is a proper authoritative lens by which we see the scripture, which fortunately was given to us by Jesus when he established Peter as the head of the apostles by giving him and him alone the keys of the kingdom. And then that authority to bind and loose, which was shared among all the apostles, but the keys, especially to Peter, was transmitted down the ages to their successors. And uh, that's a that's a big thing to, to know and to realize. Uh, and so, yeah, so it gives me confidence in, okay, like, if the Catholic Church is wrong, literally all the saints that have gone before us are wrong. And I find that unreasonable and unlikely. Um, so that that's what gives me confidence here. And over time, though, so the deposit of faith is that which came from Jesus to the apostles that was given. Once for all, delivered to the saints, is now handed down, right? That deposit, the magisterium or the teaching of the authority of the church, which was given once again to Peter and his successors by Jesus giving Peter the keys in Matthew 16, um, their authority to interpret. They don't create new doctrines, right? They they clarify, they expound upon, they share with us what that deposit is saying. And so the proper lens by which we see these verses uh, resides in in the Catholic Church. Um, and they testify that, hey, what Jesus said is actually true. When he said, this is my body, he meant it. He meant it. So all that to say is the doctrine doesn't change, or rather the deposit of faith doesn't change, but the way we can explain it, the way it comes to be understood, develops over time. So that's why, though you don't see the word transubstantiation in the Bible or in the early fathers even, the reality of what St. Thomas Aquinas talks about is there, and they believe it, even though it's not explicitly understood in those terms, because he's specifically using Aristotelian logic to describe that. And I'm not going to just describe it using the word transubstantiation. That's just one helpful way to explain the mystery. And if it's not helpful to you, you don't need to, like, use that word. Like, you're going to still um, believe in it as far as if you if you end up being Catholic, becoming Catholic, because that's what the Catholic Church holds as far as using those terms to explain the mystery. But I want to emphasize right off the bat that it really is a mystery of faith. We take it on faith. We believe it because Jesus said it. That's the end of the story. He's God. What he says goes. So, and I think that that's a very humble position to be in, right? It's that childlike faith that says, you know what? You're God. I'm not. Uh, I'm going to trust you on this one. If you say it is, I believe it. So let's go back to the beginning then, before getting to the word transubstantiation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in fact, he said, let there be light, and there was light. God, what he says goes. When he says, let there be light, there is light. When he says, and takes up the bread in his holy hands and says, this is my body, it is his body. Interestingly enough, Martin Luther actually um, did have a huge discrepancy with his fellow Protestant friends, John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli, over this matter. The Protestants were trying to have a united front against the Catholic Church in the 1500s, but they actually divided over the very issue of the Eucharist. Martin Luther retained more so of a Catholic view than the other two. He still strayed a little bit from the Catholic Church's understanding, but even he after several beers, it is said, in this very heated dialogue with those guys, he said, is means is. <laughs> However you say that in German. Uh, but he says, is means is. So Jesus didn't say, this is like my body or this is a symbol of my body. No, he said, this is my body. Okay? So sometimes people ask me, well, what, you know, what did you have before like, what do you have now as a Catholic that you didn't have before as a Protestant? And I immediately think, well, the Eucharist. 
I did not have that before. And unfortunately, Martin Luther lost that as well because he did away with what's called apostolic succession. He did away with the laying on of hands, which we'll see in the early church writings that the Eucharist is only valid when it's consecrated by a valid bishop. Why is that? Well, because the valid bishop is ordained to be in the person of Christ. Because it's not your belief doesn't make it the Eucharist. Like you can believe all day long if you go, um, let's say you go to a non-denominational church or something and you're, you're partaking of what they would call communion and bread and it's grape juice or bread and wine, whatever. And let's say you actually are like kind of starting to be convicted about like, you know, I need to eat the flesh and blood of Christ. Like he says it in John chapter six, I want to do that. St. Paul says very clearly that it's a participa- participation in the blood of Christ in 1 Corinthians 10 and the participation in the body of Christ as well in 1 Corinthians 10. So you start getting this conviction and you start saying, you know what, I need to believe that it actually is the body of Christ. And I would say yes and amen to like that desire. But fortunately, really, the Eucharist isn't made the Eucharist because of your faith or because of your belief right? Like just because you believe something to be the case doesn't mean it is the case in objective reality. So just because you believe, let's say that Santa Claus is real, doesn't mean he actually is real. Um, so the good news in that though, the, the good news there is that the Eucharist, the objective, real, metaphysical, actual presence of Jesus Christ <laughs> is an objective reality. It's not contingent upon your subjective feelings. You may not feel that it's true. You may not even you may not even believe it's true, but it's true nonetheless. Like just because you don't believe it's Jesus Christ doesn't mean it actually isn't or that it actually is. Uh so it's not contingent on your belief. Now your belief is important because if you don't rightly discern the body of Christ yourself when you partake of it, then you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. So what makes it a real Eucharist? Well, like I said, going back to the beginning, it's God himself who has to speak. Let there be light and there is light. Jesus Christ himself speaks. This is my body and it becomes his body. So uh, he gave that authority to be in the person of Christ to the apostles when he told them, do this in remembrance of me, that anamnesis that we talked about, that memorial offering. Not just, hey, just think about it every once in a while, or just think about that past time when I did the Last Supper thing, or just think about my sacrifice for you. That's not what he meant by remembrance. What he meant was that memorial offering that was prophesied in the Old Testament in uh, Malachi, that would be that pure offering that would be lifted to the, uh, unto the end of the ages as a pure offering to God, that that is what you need to hand down from generation to generation. That offering that I made on the cross needs to be made present to every generation so that I can fulfill my word. I am with you to the end of the age. So, uh, and so that, for that reason, he appoints these apostles. In turn, they appoint bishops as their successors. Um, The word episkopos in the New Testament is where we get the word bishop from. Um, some translations in First and Second Timothy translated as overseer, um, but it's the word episkopos, which we get, where, get the word bishop from. And very early on, we see the order of the church, the hierarchy of bishops, priests, and deacons. The priests um, being part of what's called the presbyterate or group of elders. And to this day, the priests are part of the presbyterate, right? So I'm 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 saying all of this because it's the authority of Christ Himself. And his words that make the bread change from bread to himself, to Jesus. So if I were to say over a piece of bread, this is my body given up for you, you should not believe that that's Jesus' body. (laughs) Like, I'm not a validly ordained bishop or priest in union with the bishop. I'm I'm just a lay person. Um... Which is a great role to have, by the way. I am filled with the Spirit of God. But my role is not to consecrate the bread and the wine. Because in the sacrament, I'm not in the person of Christ. And it's actually, it doesn't depend on the priest or the bishop's faith. But it's the anointing that he's received. That authority he's received 
So even if the priest or bishop lives a completely immoral life and himself doesn't even believe it to be the case, it objectively becomes the body of Christ by by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ himself in the in the bishop or in the priest is saying the words, this is my body. So this is why it's important to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. I did mention last time that, uh, and, and once again, the reason why it's important is because you want to be under a validly ordained bishop so that you can have a valid Eucharist. And you may be like, okay, surely the early church didn't like teach all this. And I'll, I'll quote St. Ignatius for you here in a second, and you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. But I mentioned last time that the Eastern Orthodox also have a valid Eucharist because they have valid apostolic succession, which the Roman Catholic Church says yes and amen. Um, but we still long for them to come into full communion with the Pope, with the Holy Catholic Church, because Peter alone was given the keys, and Peter alone was given that task in in, at the end of John, to, to feed the sheep, to tend the flock, to feed the lambs, right? And and so the sacrament of the Eucharist is also called a sacrament of unity. So even their Eucharist, their the Eucharist that they celebrate, which we say is valid, it actually is pointing towards a more full unity that is accomplished when it, when all of the bishops are in, uh, in communion with the Bishop of Rome. So all paths really do lead to Rome when we're talking about Christian unity and the one Eucharist. So that's why I'm not necessarily saying everyone should become Orthodox or Catholic. I'm saying, no, everyone needs to become Catholic. Um, but I understand also it's a it's a process. And fortunately, there's a lot of reconciliation between the East and the West. I myself love uh, the Eastern churches and um, almost became Orthodox myself before becoming Catholic. I explored it. Uh, a little bit. And so, anyway, I want to quote to you all Ignatius of... Well, before I quote Ignatius, I'm going to quote St. Justin Martyr because he is the one right here. Uh, he's 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 writing um, an apology, what's called an apology or defense of the Christian faith to the emperor. And this is about 160 AD. So very, very early on. Okay, like very much in that early, early church time period. And he talks about what we were talking about just earlier, about the words of Christ actually affecting the change that happens. And here's here's the crazy thing about St. Justin Martyr. The emperor and the empire were accusing Christians of, be, of being cannibals, which that in and of itself, knowing that that was an accusation of early Christians, shows that like, they were talking about this stuff and they like, everyone knew that they believed that they were eating the flesh and blood of Christ, right? And here's the thing. St. Justin Martyr could have easily just said, hey, actually everyone, it's just a symbol. Don't worry about it. We were, <laughs> it's not real, you know? Um, but he doesn't say that. That's the crazy thing. He actually says, no, it's not cannibalism. Not because it isn't really the flesh and blood of Christ. It, it actually is the flesh and blood of Christ, but it's not cannibalism because we're not just taking away his life, we're actually partaking of the living life, the living Christ, and we are deriving life from him and entering into his life while he still remains alive. And so he's saying it's the resurrected Christ. And so we don't take away the life of this person. We actually get nourished and are sustained in our lives by his very life. And so he doesn't he definitely doesn't say, oh, it's just a symbol. He says, actually, it really is the flesh and blood of Christ, but you're misunderstanding this whole thing. And uh, and here's what he says in regards to how this change happens. He says, we call this food Eucharist, and no one is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true. For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these. But since Jesus Christ, our Savior, was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the the Eucharistic prayer set down by him and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished is both the flesh and the blood of that incarnated Jesus. Whoa. 
Okay. Now, St. Ignatius of Antioch. I was talking earlier about, you know, you need to have a valid bishop and all that. And, um, and that's exactly, exactly right. So let me turn to this in the, um, this is coming from St. Ignatius' letter to the Smyrnaeans. I know it's a, it's a funny name. And this is coming from, uh, paragraph eight. And this is intense. I do want to warn you, (laughs) but it's the truth. And so uh, real quick, St. Ignatius of Antioch, he was a disciple of the apostle John. So yeah, that guy who wrote the gospel of John by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is his disciple. And so if you're wondering, well, you know, Eric, how do you know that that's the right interpretation of John chapter six or the Bible? It's like, well, what did the early church believe? Like they would probably know better than I would, you know, like I'm a 21st century American. What do I know? But I'm sure that they were onto something, you know, if they were discipled well, which I, I, you know, it's very consistent. All of their teachings consistent for the first 1500 years is all unanimous as to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And even up till now, it's been consistent in the Catholic church. Uh, so it never changed her teaching there. Um, you know, like, let's go back to what they said and see what, what they were thinking, because they probably know better than us. So once again, don't trust my opinions of the matter, uh, but you can't trust these guys and trust that they had a good idea of what was meant by the scriptures. Because once again, everyone has their own interpretations, but what we want, what we're after here on Polycarp's Paradigm is the truth. I don't care you know, you can you can make up whatever you want. You can twist the scriptures to say whatever you want. But I want to know the, what does it actually mean? What, what's the actual truth? And conform my life to that because the truth will set us free. If we know the truth, we'll be free. And I think we all want to be free. Uh, so here we go. St. Ignatius to the Smyrnaeans. Flee from divisions as the beginning of evils. You must all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father. And follow the council of presbyters as you would the apostles. Respect the deacons as the commandment of God. Let no one do anything that has to do with the church without the bishop. Only that Eucharist, which is under the authority of the bishop, or whomever he himself designates, is to be considered valid. Wherever the bishop appears, there let the congregation be. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church." It is not permissible either to baptize or to hold a love feast without the bishop. But whatever he approves is also pleasing to God in order that everything you do may be trustworthy and valid. Finally, it is reasonable for us to come to our senses while we still have time to repent and turn to God. It is good to acknowledge God and the bishop. The one who honors the bishop has been honored by God. The one who does anything without the bishop's knowledge serves the devil. So pretty strong words from uh, St. Ignatius there. So once again, the words affect the change. And how do we make sense of this? Well, we, we see this actually in our own time and space here, right? So a police officer, when a police officer, let's say he, he says, you are arrested. That means you're under arrest, <laughs> Like that, that just changed the reality of, of your life. Now, if I said, Hey, you're arrested. That actually means nothing. Like it didn't change reality. Uh, I don't have the authority. Now, if I was a police officer, that'd be different. So these bishops that are validly ordained and that are coming from, and that share that authority of the apostles that was given by Jesus, these validly ordained bishops that has been this unbroken line of succession that is to this day present in the Catholic church. They're, they have the authority that when they say in the name and the, in the person of Jesus Christ, this is my body, it is his body. When that police officer says, you are arrested, your reality just changed, you are arrested. When that umpire says in baseball, you're out, that means you're out. It doesn't even matter if the whole stadium chants that you're out. If he says you're safe, you're safe because he has that authority to say that. Now, I do want to point out this quote from St. Ignatius because he actually says that 
the heretics of his time, which there's always been heretics and schismatics, right? People that are, heresy means choice. It means to be against the church's teaching. You you choose your own path, your own interpretation. Uh, and he says those people in my time have they've abstained from the Eucharist, uh, and that's a bad now thing. note well <laughs> so, those who hold he heretical this. opinions about the grace of Jesus Christ that came to us. Know how contrary they are to the mind of God. They abstain from Eucharist and prayer because they refuse to acknowledge that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father by his goodness raised up. Once again, folks, this is written in 107 AD. This is a disciple of the Apostle John who's writing this. And so already, and you know, we see the Eucharist being a, a very hard teach. I mean, it's a hard teaching, right? Uh, in John six verse sixty six. So mind the number. Uh, it's kind of funny that people point out the number because numbers were added way later. But anyway, but in John six verse sixty six, many of Jesus' disciples left him over the teaching of the Eucharist. They drew back from him. They didn't believe it. Uh, so this is a hard teaching, and that's why we need help understanding it, and one of those helpful ways is through transubstantiation. So now that we've established that only a validly ordained bishop and the priest in union with that bishop can actually consecrate the bread and the wine to become the body and blood of Christ, as we saw from the early church fathers in their writings, then now we can turn to helpful ways of understanding this mystery. Once again, still a mystery. So transubstantiation, a tra- change in substance. So, you know, honestly, I wish you guys could see me because I'm going to use my hand motions even though you can't see me. But I'm going to try my best to just explain it then. Transubstantiation. So, imagine that there's a tree. Well, first, let me say this. Everything that there is in the world has an underlying reality to it. It's the substance or the essence of it. So you can actually know what a tree looks like in your mind's eye. You know the essence of a tree. You know um, what what a tree is. So if you went outside right now and or you saw a tree, you'd say, okay, there's there's a tree. Now, what if you were to cut off two of the branches? Would you say, oh, well, now it's not a tree. No, you'd say, that's a tree, but something's changed in it. The branches have changed. Those branches, that appearance of the tree, the that 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 part of it is called accidents. So the accidents are what change there, but the substance remain the same. Okay? Or if if you take me for example, I'm my name's Eric, and if you cut off my arm, my name's still Eric. Like I'm still who I am. Like I'm not a different person, right? Like it's me, everyone, hey. But I have one less arm, which would be uh, I wouldn't like that actually, but so my accidents, my appearance changed, my, that, that part of me changed, the accidents changed, but me, my substance, who I am, the reality of me remains the same. Transubstantiation is the opposite of what I just described. So think about that. Uh, transubstantiation is where the accidents, the appearance remains the exact same. But the substance, that underlying reality, changes. Which is why if you partake of the Eucharist, it'll still taste like bread. It still looks like bread. If you put it under a microscope, it's, it's going to say bread, bread, bread. Or the wine that's now the blood of Christ, it'll, it'll say it's wine. It'll taste like wine. So you're, you're like, okay, Eric, well, how can you possibly say that it's not wine or that's not bread? And I would say, well... It's through the light of faith that we see the reality, that his words spoke it, and so it's true that the reality is different. The accidents, yes, of course they remain the same. So when you partake of the Eucharist, don't expect that it's going to taste different. That's not the miracle. The miracle is that it looks, feels, tastes, touches the same, but the reality, the substance, the essence of this, it, the breadness is removed, and now it's Jesusness. Just as like a tree has treeness, I have humanness, bread has breadness. That reality of breadness is no longer there 
bread is no is no longer there. You it you have the accidents or the appearances of such, but the substance, the reality is that it's now Jesus Christ. So the difference between what I used to believe as a Protestant, what I now believe as a Catholic, is the difference between a piece of bread and the person of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't get much more different than that. And Jesus himself tells us in John chapter 6 that we need to see this through the eyes of faith, that we need to believe, and that you can't just, you can't know this by reason alone. You can't know this truth by your own senses or what he calls the flesh. There's a big difference between when he says my flesh and the flesh. The flesh is a is a word that's given to carnal man. That's like our senses, right? Um, so this is what Jesus says in John chapter 6. He says, um, It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. So obviously his flesh is definitely a veil. So he's not talking about his flesh, which he just said you need to eat and drink, or else you have no life in you. So obviously that is not what he's talking about. But he does say the flesh, like your own carnal person, through your senses, through your taste, through your touch, through your eyesight, you can't know this. But it's through the light of faith, through the spirit, that you can know this. And and that's, that's how we know it to be true, is because him who is truth himself said it to be. And so his words affect the change. Transubstantiation is a great way to understand this reality, this mystery. Um, And and so that's why I wanted to go over that to you. Because you may have heard of that uh, before. And lastly, I just want to talk about why why this is the case. Like, why would Jesus want to give himself to us in this way? Well, it's because of who we are. We're human beings, right? We're not angels, so we're not just pure spirits, and we're not animals, we're not irrational uh, creatures just bound to our senses, and so we're both body, we're both material, and we're immaterial, we're both body and spirit, we're both, and so Jesus Christ wants to come to you in a way that's ordered to your nature. So a human person is a body-soul composite. You cannot separate one without the other. You are your body just as much as you are your soul. Uh, The soul is the form of the body, using that language. Um, And so that's who you are. You're a human person. So Jesus wants to not only nourish your soul, but he also wants to nourish your body. He wants to meet with you spiritually and physically. He wants to make the incarnation, his physical presence, a reality to you. Now, he does this in such a way under the appearance of bread and wine so that you can actually enjoy that most intimate union possible with him in a way that's ordered to your nature, in a physical, tangible way. And this is actually something, the reason why I wanted to hit on this a little bit is because uh, next week I'm releasing the episode where I had interviewed my own dad and his conversion story. Uh, As you may know now, uh, my mom and my dad both became Catholic last year. And something we touch on in the interview is that everything in the Catholic Church is incarnational. And the reason, and, and what's funny about this perspective is that I see it now as incarnational, but before before I was Catholic, I saw it as empty religion or ritual Oh, they make the sign of the cross. They dip their hands in holy water. They do all these kneeling and genuflecting and motions with their bodies. And they have these tangible sacraments. They have to actually go to a priest to confess their sins. They actually have to do these certain actions with their bodies. And now I understand on the flip on the flip side, on the other side of it, actually, that's a beautiful thing because it's very incarnational. It's the word made flesh. It's that we're we're body and soul. So what we do with our bodies reflects our soul and and helps us enter into the spiritual realities. And so Jesus meets us physically and spiritually through the sacraments. And he, that's made possible through his ascension. That that reality of who he is is now transcendent and he can meet with us through his church, which is his body. You see, we partake of his body to become his body. 
there is no separation anymore between the head and the body. It's just one total Christ. Which, that's a mind blower. You know, like uh, St. Joan of Arc, when she was accused on trial uh, of, of things, <clears throat> by bishops nonetheless, um, she said, the difference between the, the difference between Christ and the church, as regards to the difference between Christ and the church, all I know is that they're just one thing, and we shouldn't complicate the matter. And St. Paul, on the road to Damascus, when Jesus showed up, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my followers, or why are you persecuting Christians? Because that's actually what he was doing. No, he said, why are you persecuting me? And so, as we see Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, we see Jesus Christ in the church. As we see Jesus Christ in the church, we also see him in the poor. The least of these. He says, whatever you've done to to the least of these, you've done it to me. So, the Eucharist, that faith in the Eucharist actually has very profound implications for our faith in encountering Christ through fellow, um, through fellow Christians and also through the poor, especially which in our own way, we're all the least of these if we truly reflect upon that. So that's a lot uh, for today. Um, I hope that was helpful. You know, I really want to zoom out, especially after my uh, dad's episode, and and really look at where this all is in Scripture and kind of the meta narrative of Scripture. Because it's not just John chapter 6. It's actually from Genesis to Revelation and everything in between. Like once you start seeing this, it's, it's the, everything's rooted, like I said, in the incarnation. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God loves you. God himself is love. And therefore he wants to encounter you in a way that you as a human being can encounter him. With the fullness of who you are, he wants to encounter the fullness of him in, in who you are. He wants you to encounter the fullness of him, which is the prayer of St. Paul to the Ephesians that you would know the the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ which surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Eucharist fills you with all the fullness of God. Have a great day, everyone. See ya. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.